I did walk around this morning. You have an observatory, you have uh, a nice campus, and uh, faculty and students who are passionately interested in work here, and that's what uh, maybe would drive us to better heights. But more than anything else, I, I'm grateful to the Institute for this opportunity to talk to you on a subject which is somewhat interesting, which makes us think a little bit more, and particularly to uh, Dr. Ganpule, who, with whom I have been interacting maybe for the last three years. Very forceful, and uh, I have learned from him, and uh, it, it, I, I'm grateful to him for this opportunity. He invited me here. He took care of me. In fact, we met at IIT Madras around a month ago, I think. Yes, about a month back. And he said, why not you give a talk in the, to our students, something populistic, something generic. I could only think in terms of thermodynamics, because thermodynamics is an extremely, extremely interesting subject. But he said, that is only for mechanical engineers. You know, why not you think something which will bring the other community around? And that's where I chose this particular topic. Thank you. And uh, it's been a pleasure coming and uh, talking to you on this particular subject on rockets, which are necessary for exploring space. You know, to be able to introduce the subject, maybe what I do is, maybe for the first five or six slides, I'll tell you what space is around, because we may have different notions of space. I think we must bring all of us, or I must bring all of us to the same notion which I have. Maybe it's not totally correct, perhaps. Then we will see why really, what are the real problems? Is there really some issue in space which we really look, need to address? And if so, what is the current situation of rockets? You know, we need rockets to go to space. Are there some limitations? Are there some things which we have forgotten on the way, which we must remember to introduce in the future? This is the plan I have for this particular talk. And what I do is, maybe, as I said, I'll introduce the topic of space first. And whenever we talk of space, you know, anything, for me, space is anything other than me. This is what Einstein said. And therefore, space is our environment. And when we look at the environment around us, maybe I go up a hill and look at things around me. I look all space. But we know that the universe is expanding, growing at a very fast rate. It's accelerating at a very fast rate. And therefore, how do I define? I cannot say so many kilometers or distance minus infinity to infinity. It becomes difficult. I only define space by saying what is in space. And what is in space? You have something like 10 to the power 11 galaxies up there. That also in the observable region of space. We have not yet seen the total space. Maybe in the observable region, we have something like 10 to the power 11. And 10 to the power 11 is written very easily, 10 to the power 11. But if you really start counting 10 to the power 11, maybe a lifetime is not adequate for it. Therefore, you have so many galaxies up there. Therefore, you know, it becomes difficult. We also said it's growing. Therefore, we say, well, I cannot look at uh, maybe the universe. I, I, I sort of uh, look at a small part of the universe, maybe the part of the universe wherein all of us live. And that is what we call as the Milky Way galaxy. And even this is huge, something like 10,000 light years in diameter. Light year is the distance traveled by light in one year, several million, uh, million uh, kilometers. 2005 year light year in thickness, little chubby though. And it also consists of a lot of stars, a lot of uh, maybe gas, dark matter, maybe a lo lot of things, black holes about which we read about. And even this is go going to be difficult to imagine as our environment and uh, sort of explore there. Therefore, maybe we, we maybe restrict ourselves to one particular star in our, in our uh, Milky Way galaxy, which is the sun, ar ar around which we call it as a solar system. We have something like eight planets which go around the sun, which orbit around the sun, starting from Mercury right, right up to Neptune. Formerly, Pluto was known as a particular planet, but it's not fully developed. And instead of having Navagraha, it's actually eight planets which are fully developed and have a good orbital period around the sun. And now, you know, if you look at these eight planets, maybe starting from 
Mercury, maybe Venus, Earth, and so on, up to Uranus. You know, we have sort of, you know, over the years, you know, all of these things have been investigated. Like, right from Mercury to Neptune, all have been explored. And by different satellites and all that, Voyager 1 and 2 have been more promin most prominent in this, launched in 1977. All these planets have been explored. We see that not much life, there doesn't seem to be life as we understand today, as we see to exist on these planets. Therefore, if we, but we are sure somewhere along in the universe, maybe in the Milky Way galaxy, some, some, some artificial, some life is possible because conducive to life things should be there. But it is quite possible that even though in the eight planets are ab ab around the sun, we are not having, maybe in, in, if I go beyond it, maybe in something like I go beyond the solar system, maybe life may be possible. And let us just take a look at it. We call them as exoplanets, that is planets outside our solar system. There are about 4,000 of them. And we see, you know, planets, exoplanets continue to be discovered. The latest one, around three weeks back, is by latest by a Sri Lankan scientist from Arthur C. Clarke Institute of Modern Technologies in Sri Lanka. He discovered a, a particular exoplanet in which life could possibly exist. It's, it's of the size of Neptune planet. Now the question is, you know, how do you go there? How do you go to such planets? If you look at the nearest planet outside the solar system, it is around the star called Proxima Centauri, and uh, the planet is known as Proxima Centauri b. It is 4.2 light years away. That means it's 23 times the distance of the sun from the Earth. That means it's still far away. The question is, we cannot, we don't seem to have any rockets which can go that, that far. I will qualify it a little later, I'll come back to it. Therefore, all what I have done in these first few four or five slides is, I said, well, universe is something which is little difficult to imagine. It has a lot number of galaxies. I'll, we look at ourselves in the Milky Way galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, I come to a small, small, teeny weeny part of it, which is the solar system. And if you have to explore our environment, well, we have only explored some of the planets, maybe our own moon, and we are still to look at the environment around us or space around us. Now, the question is, well, you have these exoplanets, and if, if now we have to think of how or what to do in space, what are the missions I can think of? You know, we normally take a textbook and say, I read this, therefore it is like this or something. Therefore, we look at what people say. And one of the persons is uh, Stephen Hawking. All of you know about him, you have read about him. Maybe, you know, he died around a year and a half back. He was one of the most brilliant minds we have had. He said, you know, see, you know, nowadays things are becoming difficult on Earth. The population has grown. You can't even live in Delhi. Pollution is terrible. And we are polluting the Earth. We have succeeded in polluting sufficiently. And we have to find some habitat. Maybe 100 years or 200 years from now, will it be possible to live on Earth with all the things we have? Of course, he also qualifies something. He says, we have wars, we have diseases, we have weapons of mass destruction. But I put it in a bracket because it is very conflicting. The number of wars have come down. The number of diseases have come down. We have controlled. We are controlling weapons of mass destruction, though we continue to generate more and more weapons. We are putting them because we know they will cause harm. We don't operate them. But even then, these things are there. You have terrible climatic changes. Nowadays, in Bombay, it never rains. It only pours. And so also in the south, it hardly rains. But when it rains, there is a deluge. And this is all due to our climatic changes, which we are experiencing today. Of course, pollution is totally different. Therefore, he feels humanity will not survive for another millennium without And unless we have some means of escaping and settling in some other planet or in some other place which is friendly, well, we are doomed. This is point one. Then this is an incentive, according to him, for having future space missions. Let us examine two or three such space missions. Then let's go to the next one. You know, 
you study asteroids and mine asteroids. You know, asteroids are objects in space. Essentially, between Venus and Jupiter, you have something like loose objects which are going there. They, they normally orbit around the sun. But you know, the Earth's attraction, the gravitational pull, sometimes focuses them towards the Earth. And we have cases when some asteroids come and hit the Earth. And when asteroids hit the Earth, well, we are doomed. That is how we lost dinosaurs around 66 million years ago. But more importantly, you know, today on Earth, you know, we like gold, we like silver. Unfortunately, we give too much importance to it. But if you look at gold and silver, or for that matter, even water, it came to us. When Earth was created, there was no water, there was no, no mineral on Earth. It is these comets, it is these asteroids which hit the Earth. Like you look at Mars, it is full of craters and all that. It is these things which brought the noble materials onto the Earth. This was several million years ago. And therefore, people say, why not I go to an asteroid and mine the asteroid for gold? Maybe other noble materials may be there. And therefore, there is a lot of interest in going to different asteroids. And we have missions from Europe, from NASA, from Japan, who go and look at the different asteroids from the greedy objective of getting noble materials to Earth. You know, because we need these materials. And in fact, you know, one of the materials which was recovered from one of the asteroids was N. Scott A after a cosmological chemist by name Dr. Edward Scott. That means, you know, yes, there are exotic materials which we would like to bring from space onto the Earth. This is the second mission. First mission is life on Earth is difficult, I have to escape Earth. Second is you get minerals. Let us take two more cases. And the third case is, you know, nowadays we are all rich, you know. When we were young, I think money was not that important. And we used to be happy with a frugal existence. Nowadays, it's no longer there. All of us go abroad for vacation or something like that. At least we see people going on vacation abroad. And now it's so fashionable to go on vacation to space. In fact, there are people, private players, including Russian Space Agency, who take people along with suitcases. They go, go something like 100 kilometers up in space, look at Earth look at beautiful blue earth and all that, hey, I have, have experienced zero G, I looked at earth, they come back. And therefore, space tourism is a catching business, it's a booming business. And I don't think we should lag behind. Yes, we need rockets, and there are people who do space tourism. It's not something which is not there. In fact, the Russian Space Agency does it. We have scale composites in USA, Bert Rotan. These are all private players, SpaceX, Elon Musk. You would have read of Elon Musk. He's a managing director of the Tesla Motor Company. He, he operates it, and therefore people go to space. The last one is a little scary, though. You know, we keep on telling, see, the dinosaurs got uh, extinct around 66 million years ago because a particular asteroid hit the Earth and removed civilization then. It must not happen to us. But you know, if you look back, we know there are something like 8 million asteroids in our solar system. And every, every two weeks, we have in the newspaper, hey, this asteroid has just missed the Earth. We also hear that this space station has been hit by an asteroid. Fortunately, there was only a puncture. All the, all the astronauts got huddled into the space capsule. How do you remove this? How do you he remove these fears? Therefore, in this particular talk, we will just address these four minor points relating to missions in space. There are other points which are, are not as important as these four, and we will concentrate on these four points. Having said that, let us uh, go forward. Yes, there, but we must not also rule, lose reality. This is for future. If you look at present, well, we know conquest of space was thought of in September 1951. In another five or six years, we had Sputnik, which was the Russian carrier which launched uh, a, a, a satellite Sputnik in, in, into orbit. And uh, this was from Russia. And another few months, we had explored it. This was the first time when space got started. And today, we use uh, missions to space for communication purposes, for TV, for reconnaissance, for looking at Earth, for looking at our crops. We, we want to go to explore. Ex exoplanets, which we are still unable to do. 
We look at objects in space like asteroids. We have our own enemies whom we spy on using uh, uh, spacecrafts from rockets. We also use science and experiment. That's what we use it. You know, in the Indian context, see, this is in the general context. In the Indian context, yes, we do use rockets, we do use space. You know, how did it all begin with? You know, India in the early 70s and 60s was a rather poor country. You know, you had places like uh, the township of Jabua in MP, very, very backward. No, no human being could go there. It was at that time, maybe an, uh, a program got started known as Satellite for Instructional Television Experiment site. See, this was formulated by Dr. Sarabhai at that time. And what was suggested was, again, he, he was more of an academic. He just signed up. He, he studied at MIT in USA. He signed up with MIT a proposal wherein one of the American satellites by name made at Fairchild, known, known as ATSF, would be used. This satellite was made by Fairchild Company. It was situated over Africa. It was launched in 76. He said, "Let give, a, give us a loan for something like a year, and we will try to use it in the Indian context. And that's where a study program got initiated. And this is the old copy. You see, you know, the, the report, I just took a copy of it. It had turned almost yellow and black by now. It used to be pure white when the program got initiated. And this program went through like over three or four years. And there was visible improvement in, in the backward areas like Jabua. You know, health conditions uh, improve. And we could, could face out. It's one of the major contributions where world uh, appreciated it. We could improve the living conditions in some of the backward areas. And that is where the idea of Indian national satellite got generated. And this is the background of it ever since we keep launching space spacecrafts. And not only from India we launch. You look at any country in the world, they keep launching rockets and satellites. You know, rockets are quite simple to make. It's not as complicated as an internal combustion engine, which is rotating. It has all these uh, crankshafts, and it has to operate for a long time. Rockets operate for a short time. It's not that complicated. And we have rockets which are launched by different countries. And the question is, will the existing one suffice for the four missions what I told you? The question is, let's, let's just take a look at it. Therefore, we have to look at the principle of rockets to begin with. Therefore, let, let's, let's take a look at the principle by which a rocket operates. Being students, we need to know what, what causes a rocket to move. Therefore, you know, I keep telling this, but I do not know whether I am totally right. See, nature has evolved over several million and million years. You have everything in nature. There is nothing in nature which is not engineering. Therefore, if, if we are real good engineers, we must be able to observe nature. And if we observe nature, most of our problems are solved. Therefore, if I have to look at a rocket, well, I don't need to really start from a scratch and say momentum transfer, Newton's laws. I just look at nature. I see some of these fishes, something known as a giant squid. All what it does is it has a big muzzle here. It opens it, uh, swallows a lot of water. As it swallows water, it also gobbles some sand, maybe some small fish and all that. It contracts its muscle, builds up some pressure, and opens its mouth, squirts water. And while it squirts water, the reaction, that is the change in momentum, causes it to go forward. And in one, one squirt, it can go by 50 meters, it can leap. Mind you, in water, therefore in air, if such a thing were to happen, it could go much faster. And it travels at a speed of something like 25 kilometers per hour. Therefore, the main thing is, yes, this giant squid, it moves by squirting out water. And this is one of the giant squid which was caught off New Zealand in 1996. It's from uh, National Geographic. But therefore, what is a rocket then? Well, I can, I'll t take a can of water, maybe this bottle of water, maybe put uh, uh, inverted. I allow water to be skirted out by pre having add pressure here. And the water moves up. And even this water rocket can go to a height of around 300 to 400 meters. Therefore, it's just the momentum principle which drives the rocket. But then, you know, the motion is slow. You, you need to have more energy for squirting. 
And again, I look at nature. I look at the tiniest of one of the insects. I look at something known as beetle. You know, during the rainy season, these black bugs, they keep coming to our houses. All what we do is we put a sheet of paper, excuse me, collect it and throw it out. Harmless, you can even catch it with your hand and throw it out. You know, one such beetle is known as bombardier beetle. It's not found in India, but it's found in the Mexican region. And you know, this operates on, or this illustrates the rocket principle more than anything else. Let's take a look at it. You know, this being a harmless thing, you know, in life, you know, if you're, if you're too soft, you're taken for granted. Everybody bugs you, maybe they bully you. And so also this fellow is bullied. And what bullies it? Maybe these ants, they go and bite it. And bite is means, you know, a bee bites you, it's like injects formica. Formica means carboxylic acid. And in Greek, Greek for, formic means ant. And therefore, the ant troubles it. And nature has provided it with a very great system to protect itself. How does it protect itself? It has two stomachs here. I use the word stomachs because it is for illustration. In one stomach, it keeps whatever it eats, it excretes hydrogen peroxide in one stomach. In the other stomach, it has hydroquinone, which is just a hydrocarbon. In this, you have hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidizer. In this, you have hydrocarbon. And when an ant bites it, it, it secretes both the hydrogen peroxide and the hydroquinone, which is a fuel, into the third stomach, which is coated with enzymes, which act as a catalyst. And here, the combustion or burning of the oxidizer with fuel takes place. It generates high, high temperature gases, which it squirts on the ant. And this high temperature gas makes it propel forward. It can go over water. And if you look at a rocket principle, it's nothing more than this. You have pressure being built up, or you have the fuel and the oxidizer, which enters into the combustion chamber. You heat it, you generate hot gases, you squirt it out, and the rocket moves forward. Therefore, the rocket is a simple system, wherein maybe you use the, oxi the hot gases instead of cold water, because cold water has less energy, hot air has much higher energy. But we also remember that heat is a very poor form of energy. Heat is the most despicable or the lowest form of energy. Why? It is all random molecules which are moving. When I walk, I want to walk in a particular direction. If all my molecules are in the same direction, I have much better efficiency. Whereas heat being random, it is a lower form of energy. Is it the right choice as on today? We operate by using these chemical means, and all our rockets are chemical rockets. We say low, high entropy, or heat is a lower order of energy because of higher entropy. And all what we do is burn gases. We have, you know, the other parts of our rocket are simple. You have fuel, you have oxidizer, you pump it into a chamber, you ignite it, you push it out, and this is how you convert heat. Therefore, you generate heat by burning low entropy fuels and oxidizer, convert it into high entropy or low grade thermal energy and direct it to do to generate force and then to do work this is all a rocket principle is about therefore now if you want to improve the rockets maybe we have to think in terms probably of moving away from this chemistry from this combustion and having fires which are essentially not not that desirable into something can i use a field can i use a force to generate Gen to generate momentum, change of momentum. Change of momentum is impulse. Use the impulse to push myself. This is something which we will debate during the uh, uh, subsequent um, part of this particular talk. Having said that, I think we have to understand a little bit more. Yeah, you have a rocket. You have a change of momentum. You, you push it up. It goes with a velocity. I need further velocity. Therefore, I put one more rocket on it. The first fellow has given me a velocity delta v1. I put second one, which gives me delta v2. I add together. I put more and more stages, and I keep going forward. And I get the velocity what I want. This is known as rocket staging. And therefore, I develop a multi-stage rocket, a three-stage rocket. And then I have delta v. I put a delta v, and I say I get into orbit around the Earth. Or I orbit around a planet. I want to orbit around the sun. I have the, all the velocity what I want. But what does this particular word orbit mean to us? It means something more. Can I, can I 
have some description of what an orbit is. I show in this slide a little girl standing up uh, on the above the earth. She let's say she goes above the earth and throws a ball uh, through, uh, or throws, throws a stone horizontally with some velocity v. You know, up in space there is no air, there is no resistance. The stone will try to go straight and straight. Therefore, the stone tries to go straight, but then the earth attracts it. You have the gravitational field of the earth. The stone, instead of going straight, comes a little bit here. It goes here, it comes here. Therefore, instead of going straight like this and escaping the earth, the, the stone follows the earth round and round. And this is what we call is the path taken by the stone, which is the orbit. And this, it is this way that the planets, or each one, whether it is Mercury or whether it is Earth, we all of us go round and round the Earth. And if I look at this stone, you know, the inertia takes it forward, but it is freely falling. Therefore, the stone is freely falling, like each one of us on the Earth are freely falling towards the Sun. At this point of time, all of us are freely falling towards the Sun, but the, we are attracted by the Earth and we are here. Therefore, these freely falling bodies give us the notion of, of zero g effect. And it is like, you know, you go to the circus, you see this particular uh, cage here, the motorcyclist goes round. So also, the spacecraft like INSAT goes round the Earth. We say it is orbiting round the Earth. I think with this, the initial definitions of what I wanted to say uh, get over. And so we keep on building bigger and bigger rockets because I need heavier satellites to go. And this I show, maybe this is the most recent uh, GSLV Mark III, this is the Mark I. This is what we call chemical rockets. I burn fuel, I burn oxidizer, I generate hot gases, and I keep moving up and go round the Earth. And this is what a rocket does. If the rocket is going to do this, well, let's see how a rocket really operates. Put the staging together. This I, I had a uh, movie of the Mark I, uh, GSLV Mark I. You know, initially you have all the rockets put together. Then initially the straps we fire, the ground stage fires, the rocket sort of the core is still not firing. The rocket keeps moving up. As it moves up, we, we try to eliminate the heavy mass which has fired. We throw it out. We throw the part which has used. We throw the interstage out. And so the next stage fires. And after it fires, again, we throw the unused part of the rocket or the used part of the rocket. The unused part still moves along until the final stage fires. And ultimately, we are left with the, that is the unused stage is falling out. We are left with the thing behind the heat shield. And then you unfurl the satellite and the satellite moves around. Therefore, this is basically staging. You like to, you can always accelerate a lower mass to a higher velocity and that's why we are essentially to throw away the things. Having seen that, you know, if you look at what is the research content or what is the new work which is done in the area of rockets, not necessarily by India, we, have, we are still to do it. We find that, you know, instead of throwing away all these things, can I reuse them such that I save some money? Not only I save some money, I don't need to fabricate so many things, it becomes too difficult. And these private players like Elon Musk, he makes rockets which are reusable. And, and Elon Musk, yes, he, he's, a, he's a master, he is a uh, chairman of the Tesla electrical car company, he makes solar things, he, he has a space boring company in which he wants to travel at supersonic speed. He does a lot of things. But he's one person, as a private player, he's able to bring things back to Earth and even if you look at US, you know, this is how a rocket goes up and comes down. When it comes up, you fire these retro rockets and make it land smoothly, like what Chandrayaan-2 was supposed to do on moon. And this is how the, the rockets function. You have not only Elon Musk, but you have a lot of these private players, both in UK and USA. This man is a millionaire and they have money. They, they use aircrafts for going. You take a rocket and spaceship in this go to something like 12 kilometers from there, they fire the rockets and take the, our friends who, who want to take a look at space. You know, our, with the space suits, they are all there to go and explore space. And so, you know, it need not be by retro rockets. You can also capture them by, uh, by, by, by bringing them through parachutes. And this is what 
Amazon founder Jeff Bezos do? You know, I was particular to take these three or four names because they are all entrepreneurs. They are not rocket scientists, they are not aeronautical engineers, but people with general common sense. And this is all what is required for engineering. You know, we must be able to use our observations very foc in a focused manner to generate whatever product we want. And well, to recapitulate again, just like I use the gas cylinder at home to generate the hot gases and I cook here, so also I use fuel and oxidizer to generate hot gases in a chamber and this is what chemical rockets are all about. There's nothing more than that. And if you want more advanced rockets, well, I need more velocities. How do I get more velocities? The exhaust must have low density. That means products of combustion, if I burn carbon and carbon dioxide, I get carbon dioxide whose molecular mass is 12 plus 30 to 44 grams per mole. Whereas if I use hydrogen and oxygen, I have water, H2O, 2 plus 16, 18. Therefore, well, this is about half. The density is around less than half of uh, carbon dioxide. Therefore, I am better off burning hydrogen and oxygen. But hydrogen and oxygen are gases. Therefore, I liquefy it. And I liquefy it. It is at cryogenic temperatures. And this is where cryogenic rockets are more efficient. It is nothing more. Hydrogen oxygen is the easiest, easiest to burn. Even if I do not want to burn hydrogen, I have a hydrogen cylinder. I open the cylinder. A jet of hydrogen issues into the air, and it automatically catches fire. Therefore, we see, well, the rocket is not as complicated as some of the newspapers say rocket science is very difficult. No, far from that. And therefore, the question is, I, I ask myself this question again and again. Can I have a rocket to burn without heat, which is a low form of energy? Can I use mechanical energy? Can I use the environment itself to push a rocket? And this is important. We'll, we'll come back to this question in another few minutes. But before that, we, we also know, well, I could use electrical field. I, instead of using the gravitational field, I use the electrical field. I have charges which are generated. I accelerate the charges in an electrostatic field. Or in a, in a charge which is moving at a velocity v, in a magnetic field I accelerate it, I could use electrical field and magnetic field. Well, we do use electrical fields and magnetic fields, and we call them as electrical rockets. These are routinely used in many of the satellites. Even though on ground I gen get small forces, electrical rockets are also used. Similarly, yes, I think we'll skip this. this is more detailed of electrical rockets. I can also use nuclear field. I use the weak nuclear field, like, like radioactive decay. Here I have maybe uh, polonium getting into lead and this and get generating neutrons or helium and in the process some change of substance is taking place. I have heat energy. Or I have fission. I have uranium which is broken up into krypton and barium and in the process I generate energy. Fission process which is a strong nuclear field. Or I have fusion of hydrogen of deuterium and tritium to give me helium which, is, which I combine at high temperatures. And I use the heat generated to have in a heat exchanger to heat some hydrogen gas or something. And again, I have something like a thermal rocket. Even though nuclear rockets generate high thrust, again, it's a thermal mechanism. And as I said, thermal mechanism does not seem to be the most ideal form of propulsion. The thing is that it is a lower form of energy. But today, all our power plants, whether it's a steam power plant, there's a gas power plant, or if you are talking in terms of may, maybe our propulsive devices like cars and all that, all run on heat, right? You have uh, fuels which generate heat and we are, we are stuck to it. The question is for rockets, can I have something different? Therefore, according to Stephen Hawking, well, I use a huge uh, sail and I allow the light that is the photon to impinge on it, the photon reflects back generates pressure on this particular sail and I use forward. And this has also been used for propulsion, mind you. That means you use photon rockets. Photon rockets are something like you have a CubeSat and nowadays most of the institutes, most of the colleges, the students generate CubeSats, that is a, a satellite in a particular small form. And they use something like this. They, 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 it has not been done by India, but Planetary Society has launched such a thing quite recently on 23 June 
2019, it has been deployed and it has been used in propulsion. Therefore, let us, let us now take, take a look at it. You know, rockets, as we see, are simple. Generally uses chemical energy. By staging, you go up in space, you orbit, you go wherever you want. You go and orbit around the sun or you orbit around the earth, wherever you want you go. But you know, almost all countries have space programs. Like one of the classic things is, well, recently there was this picture which came in all the newspapers. That means in Iran, there was a blast. During one of the rocket launches, something went wrong and there was a mishap. It was widely published in US and it came in our Indian papers also, saying that uh, Iran had a failure in the rocket and uh, because Iran uh, was not friendly with US and uh, it was well advertised in US saying Iran has a failure. You come back to Sri Lanka, they have their own Ramana satellite. You even go to a small company like New Zealand, yeah, they launch, they launch rockets and mind you, this, this rocket goes up and comes back, re-entry. Therefore, you know, you have a lot of these satellites in orbit and the question is, the, the satellite from New Zealand is known as an electric, uh, electron rocket, a small one carrying a small satellites and this will come back, it will be recovered by a by a particular helicopter and brought back, that means reuse. The question is, when we launch all these satellites, they, there are innumerable satellites which are orbiting. Therefore, if I were to look at the numbers which are there, you know, the space around us is full of debris, it's full of pollution. Not only have we succeeded in the last 30, 40 years in totally polluting our Earth around us, if I want to go to space, I'm in trouble. There are millions of particulates, millions of spent satellites, millions of old satellites, millions of rockets which have done their job, which are also in orbit. Therefore, the point is, if I launch a satellite, it's quite possible today that it's going to impact on each other and it may not launch. We call this pollution in space as maybe the space debris. The space debris is again of two forms, just like we have pollution on ground. We say man created pollution. We say pollution from natural sources. We know pollution from natural sources is quite large. So also in space we have natural sources which cause pollution, anthropogenic or human created sources of pollution. And what are the natural sources? We talked in terms of asteroids which are there, which could come and hit the earth. They could also hit our satellites, it's one of them. We have meteors, meteoroids. We could have celestial objects, and celestial objects are objects which come from, uh, from space outside our solar system. One such celestial object, which, which was recently discovered, is known as Aumuamua. You know, this is a name given by, uh, in Tahiti, some name is given. But you know, if you look back in 1973, the science fiction author, Arthur Clarke, talks in terms of an extraterrestrial object which is also posing a problem from the natural sources that is his, the book is known as Randover with Rama. And you know, the, some of the science fiction authors have also been worried about space debris from natural sources. When we talk of anthropogenic sources, we have leftover cases of rockets. I showed you a launch in which things are thrown out. You have satellites which have finished their lifetime and what decides the lifetime? A satellite carries its fuel. In about 10 to 15 years, all the fuel is over. It's as good as gone. It keeps orbiting. You know, you put a stone, it keeps on going round and round. It is a source of a problem. You have debris from impacting satellites. We also know, you know, we had an anti-satellite test uh, ab about, uh, about six months back. It, it was known as Mission Shakti, in which we destroyed a satellite using a missile. It generated fragments. But India was the, not the only country. China did it in 2007. They did it again in 2012. And you have US, Russia, which does all this anti-satellite. And each creates a debris. And this debris is very harmful. Therefore, the question is, even though I said earlier, we, have, we need something to leave the Earth. Hey, the, the space around us is so much polluted that I need some fix for it. I have to do something to get over this debris problem. Fortunately, I find some startups even in India. And that also, in this small state of Uttarakhand, there is a startup consisting of a few students who want to take up this challenging task. 
they are devising something like using some imaging known as LIDAR and stuff like that to be able to get over this. Therefore, there are a lot of opportunities for all of us. But getting back to the subject, well, let us take a look at one of the natural sources. But rather than look at debris in space, let us first see whether this asteroid is really going to hit the Earth. If it is going to hit the Earth, well, all of us are gone. But is it a hoax? Why does newspaper, every few weeks, I always read something. Hey, asteroid is going to hit the Earth. This asteroid, 2010 AU, will hit the Earth on, I think, day after tomorrow. And then after, day after tomorrow, news comes, it narrowly missed the Earth. How did it miss the Earth? By 20,000 kilometers. Hey, but 20,000 kilometers in space is something like a millimeter. It could have come and hit us. Therefore, what is this? What are the chances? Has, has something happened? Therefore, what happens if some asteroid comes near to the Earth? Well, it enters the atmosphere. It becomes a huge fireball. All the asteroid evaporates. It's a huge ball of fire. And since the energy is being rapidly converted to heat, well, I have blast waves. I have high temperatures. I have shock waves, which hits us. And that is how we lost all our dinosaurs, maybe 66 million year, years ago. But it's not only the dinos, dinosaurs which we lost. If you go back, if you look at India itself, we have some lakes, like Lonar Lake in Maharashtra. You look at the lake in a beautiful circle. How did it form? An asteroid hit the Earth, and the blast wave which comes, blast wave is somewhat spherical. It forms a crater, and then the crater, you know, when you go and examine the Earth, it's all fused mud, like they call it as masculinite, which is naturally occurring glass. And you have such, such craters which are formed. Therefore, it's not that today we are talking of this. Yes, it has been happening. And one such asteroid known as Apophis. Apophis means a serpent. And this particular serpent snake has been troubling this Egyptian god Ra. And he is the god of the sky. And therefore, since asteroid Apophis is something like a fairly big asteroid and supposed to hit the Earth, we call it by the name Apophis. And on April 13, 2036, it is supposed to hit the Earth. It is supposed to go around the Earth, very near to it in 2029, come back and probably hit the Earth. And we need a fix. See, I cannot sit here today, like what people maybe 66 million years ago, if they were still not, uh, if they were still not properly evolved. I cannot say, well, I'm going to give up and uh, uh, give myself up. We need some fixes. What are the probable fixes we could have? Question is, can we save ourselves from the problem of asteroid hitting the Earth? Therefore, I take two or three examples. In the year July 30, 1908, in a place known as Tunguska in Siberia, one asteroid, a small asteroid, re-entered the atmosphere, impacted the atmosphere, and you know the entire region of Siberia shook. Everything was devastated. But in those days, you know, you know, for 50 kilometers, everything got damaged. But in those days, you know, it well, it broke windows, it killed people, several kingdoms, but it was not properly reported. But you go to net, you put Tunguska and you put Siberia, well, the impact of this asteroid is known. Well, we come very close. You know, when I was teaching the subject of explosions, and in explosions, we are basically talking in terms of maybe a blast wave. You know, how to explain? It so happened in the year 2013, on 15th February, at a place known as Ekaterinburg in Chelyabinsk, again in Russia, you had a small asteroid of 17 meters, which enters the stratosphere of the Earth. It created a huge ball of fire, and it created a huge, huge crater. Now, the question is, fortunately, in this, you know, even though something like 2,000 people got injured, and several hospitals and buildings got damaged, there was no casualty because Ekaterinburg is a sparsely occupied place. If it were to happen in any metro city, you know, you can imagine the catastrophe. But then, you know, as I said earlier, yes, this Apophis is 20,000 kilometers away. Supposed to, uh, it, it came near to the Earth in, it, it is supposed to come near to the Earth in 2029, April 13, to come back in 2036, chances of hitting the Earth are more. This is somewhat bigger. 
possible threat in is probability is 1 in 43,000. But in space, probability of 1 by 43,000 is a good number. We cannot say, well, it's a small number and keep quiet. Are there some way, is there some way by which I can, I can avoid the catastrophe? Because if, it, if the asteroid impacts the ocean, well, I, I, I'm going to create blast waves in the ocean. I'm going to create tsunami. Tsunami is going to have secondary effects. If it's going to impact in atmosphere, I have blast waves, which is going to kill all of us in the region where it impacts. Or is it going to be so big that it's going to lead to a living organism like a dinosaur becoming something like a history itself? Therefore, we need some fixes. And therefore, we say, well, dinosaurs became extinct when a when a huge asteroid, six, six mile wide asteroid, hit the now Gulf of Mexico at a place known as Chicxulub, which, is, uh, uh, which formed a crater of 150 kilo, kilometer diameter. And therefore, we need some fixes. Therefore, is there some way a rocket can, can help us? This is something we have to keep in mind as a mission for the future. Therefore, let's see, let's put some ideas together. Well, you know, masses attract each other. If I can carry a lot of material up in space, and I create a huge mass next to the asteroid Apophis, or any other asteroid which is supposed to hit, and mind you, there are several observatories, especially in US and some in Europe, which keep tracking these space debris and the asteroids. And they tell us, well, it's going to come. Maybe as soon as I know it's going to be some, some large distance from the Earth, I go and position some mass. And by Newton's gravitational law, well, I have this huge mass, which is uh, huge uh, mass, which is created by a satellite, is slightly deflected, deflected by a few radians, and that is sufficient for it to escape the Earth. This is one thought which is being given by the world community. Or else, I go, I shine a laser, but if I have a laser on the ground and shine it up in space, the, the air molecules which are around us in the atmosphere will scatter it, the laser light will get weakened. Maybe I go to the space, the space station, which is situated something like 200 kilometers away, where there's not much um, atmosphere at all, no atmosphere at all. From there, I put this. In fact, they did uh, ferry some, some uh, la laser, uh, uh, lasers to the space station. And maybe I shine it here, maybe I, I, I eat into it, and. Uh, uh, may be deflected by generating some force. You know, after all, you need a force. Or else I take a rocket, attach it to an asteroid, and you know, nowadays we have walking in space, therefore a man goes and attaches a rocket in space and shifts it away. Maybe impact something, and uh, impact is done all the time, but if I impact something, the asteroid will break, and I will create more danger than if, if it is not broken. Therefore, I have different missions, and you know, you have US and Europe, they are working on saving uh, the Earth from asteroids using deflection mechanisms. As I told you, there are startups in India which are also looking at debris and stuff like that. But this is something which we got to think of. Therefore, you know, in fact, if you look at some of the recent asteroid missions of NASA and ESA, you have one particular uh, impact probe which sent a probe onto the moon of the asteroid Didymos, it's known as Didy Moon, and uh, the material of the asteroid was studied such that how best we could deflect it. Well, these are some things, you know, you also map the temperature distribution for the best way to deflect an asteroid. Therefore, we think, yes, we do have means of rocket propulsion to be able to save ourselves from asteroid, provided I think some of these things succeed, and some of you younger generation people will be working on it. Having said that, let us also go to the next step. As I said, supposing there is some calamity on Earth. Suppose some asteroid is going to hit it, and we are not going to be effective in deflecting it. All of us would like to escape. You know, None of us are going to say, well, I give up. I'm going to die. No. Uh, die is nobody accepts death, right? And therefore, we say, well, I have to escape Earth in the event of a calamity, or even if I have polluted the Earth more than enough, I cannot keep staying, I get asthma, I get this. I have to go somewhere wherein I can live decently. We said none of the planets support life. Earth's moon does not support life. 
but earth's moon has an advantage it has an advantage in that it can be used as a base from the base i can go somewhere else i go to the moon from the moon i jump away in the moon if i can have some water i i i i refuel my system and i can go to some other system but if i go if i talk in terms of the nearest planet alpha centauri b which is 4.37 light years away or 23 times the distance of earth from the sun you know how do i reach there to be able to reach i cannot reach in 100 years that means say my working life is 40 years and do you think i am interested in anything more than 40 years i say i come on give up i therefore you know you need a generation that means as you go up this space capsule you must be able to have children of your own the children will go there well it's not possible you know you need to have some other way of going to space how do i do that can i think in terms of doing this if i talk in terms of a new horizon rocket which was launched into pluto pluto as i said is not really a planet and you have dust around it you have asteroids around it known as kuiper belt you know it was launched on in 2006 took 9 years to go there mind you the planet if you go to jupiter it takes around another 5 years to go to 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 jupiter juno mission it was by an atlas centaur rocket and how how do you go there you know voyager rocket which was which, which was uh, one of the best known satellites which uh, 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 which looked at or which which uh, looked at all the planets around you know it 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 left the uh, the milky way galaxy oh no it left the interstellar system that means it 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 escaped the sun's gravity only recently it took 41 years for it to go it still has to take another 150 years for it to reach the alpha centauri b it is very far far away why is it because the rocket can give only limited velocity unfortunately whenever we use rockets we use the newton's laws of mechanics or newton's law of gravitational forces and newton's law of gravitational forces is valid only for weak gravitational forces gravitational force is very weak 9.81 meter per second square it's a weak force all of us know yes we have studied in high school it's a weak weak natural or forces in nature therefore we need better rockets we need better rockets which can go at the speed of light if or near to the speed of light but can i go the question is well we talked of stephen hawking's we talked in terms of sail propulsion which is catching on this was the idea of uh, professor stephen hawking's well can i use instead of the low grade heat a low entropy source which is a mechanical source is a question we also nowadays talk that universe is expanding if universe is expanding there must be something which makes the universe ex- expand because the gravitational force of all the celestial bodies will attract it it should make it shrink it never shrinks it expands that means there is some force and that force apparently comes from the dark matter and let's see whether we can use dark matter or instead of talking in terms of newtonian mechanics can i talk of einstein or relativistic mechanics wherein space time curvature can be used for locomotion or motion itself you know these are things which are being talked of to some it appears as fiction but no it's far from fiction it is possible let let's take a, a look at some of these things well to be able to do this we have to be clear about the limitations of the existing rockets we say rocket principle is based on newtonian mechanics in which velocities has got to be very much very very much less than the speed of light because the gravitational field is weak the current rocket principle is simple and precise because it's very easy to make rockets based on newton's laws of motion we have the three laws inertia force and action and reaction laws of thermodynamics the three laws very very clear we use these laws to be able to make rockets but newton's gravitational force will fail in the limit of objects traveling under large gravitational forces and moving at high speed speed of light therefore you know we the the basic premise becomes difficult and how why does it become difficult you know whenever we study newtonian mechanics we study in the inertial frame of reference that means 
if I move and you move, we are talking of relative velocities. But uh, light does not follow the relativistic law or the relative motion law. It follows the Lorentz transformation or rather the loss of nature prevents any one of us traveling at speed of light because you cannot push of speeds above the speed of light which is a physical constant. But why is it so? Maybe physically I will explain it by saying well equivalence of energy and mass an object moving at will add to it at a high velocity will add to its mass and therefore if an object moves at higher and higher speeds it has more kinetic energy the kinetic energy means its mass increases therefore if an object moves at 10 percent of the speed of light its mass increases by 0.5 percent if it moves at 90 percent the speed of light its mass is twice times the normal mass which is moving at low velocities if an object moves at speed of light well its mass is, is infinity its mass keeps increasing I cannot travel at this then how do I move at high speeds therefore the implications are I cannot push the objects to move at high speeds I can only do planetary mission but if I want to go beyond the sun into some some particular planet in which there is intelligence in which human beings can comfortably stay and we have the concept of maybe other people like us maybe we provided they have also not polluted their atmosphere it's quite possible they have also polluted we don't really know therefore I think we need some fixes and maybe one such fix is as I said star chip wherein you use laser and project but it, it can only go up to 80 percent of the speed of light but then it can go within 40 years to Alpha Centauri but is there a better way and this is what many of the rocket scientists are working on one such mission is known as bessemer variable area specific impulse uh, magnetic rocket this is used only for mars mission but it's not fully developed in this you use argon plaza con plasma contained in a strong magnetic field you use the magnetic field to put the push the plasma out and you have good acceleration you need superconducting magnets and you have something like nuclear power to generate the magnetic field it's of something like 10 megawatt power it's something which seems to be doable but still does not is not capable of going to alpha centauri then how do we go further well even in india i said why i say even in india we are working on dark energy we have at a place no i in jharkhand a mine at jaduguda wherein it's a old unused mine wherein people are investigating the dark matter you know dark matter should have some energy and they are looking at dark matter and perhaps if dark matter is found maybe could the dark matter be used maybe a space capsule traveling it gets the dark matter from the ambience in the space and is used for propulsion purposes or you just just use as a mechanical force for pushing the rocket up but more importantly this is something which seems doable can I use Einstein's law of, of, of relativity and what is it what is what is gravity see after all you know when I say gravity I, uh, I say masses attract each other and why does a mass attract maybe I think in terms of a tarpaulin or a cloth I put a heavy mass the thing comes down I put a small mass it attracts to it that means there's a space time curvature which attracts a lower mass into a higher mass therefore higher gravitational fields I can generate by modifying the space time curvature and how do I modify the space time curvature well I use some magnetic field or something to do it it's still not clear we only recently discovered the gravitational waves and gravitational waves are also from the perturbations in the space time curvature therefore space time curvature seems to be doable but fortunately for us even Russia has developed a torpedo a submarine how does the submarine move if I if I make a submarine move in water it has terrible of this viscous resistance but if I can somehow ensure that the submarine as it moves in water is encased in a, a, a huge ball of air or vacuum then it will not see the resistance that means what they do is they call it a super cavitating torpedo in which as it moves it generates by cavitation a vapor cloud around it and it moves in the vapor cloud so that it can move much faster 
The question is, can I use space-time curvature? How do I use space-time curvature? I warp the space-time or the space-time field, and when I warp it, you know, it is something like I use the I, I use the field itself to move. It's something like I have the escalator. See, when I use the escalator, I don't move. The field around me moves, or I use a walk walking. I have the escalator moving along along this. I just situate myself. The field is moving. I move along with the field. Can I use the the space-time curvature to be able to field myself? This is known as field propulsion because I move the field, and therefore we can say, well, it is one form of moving. But then it looks, as of now, a little bit like science fiction. But let us also remember, science fiction is not. Is not totally different from science facts. Why I say this? You know what what was said, maybe several years ago. Maybe you had science fiction authors like Jules Verne, Arthur Clarke. Hey, whatever they said has come true. In fact, the geostationary orbit or communication satellite by which all of us watch TV today, and you have the communication satellite going wrong, was not invented by a scientist. Was not invented by an engineer. But it was invented by Arthur Clarke, who is a science fiction author. He also invented saying that terrestrial objects like Oumuamua, which recently came, which was noticed around, I think, three weeks back, he had predicted it. You know, some of these things, by even though some are fiction, do come true. And you know, if I look back at the history, you know, you had in 100 AD, that's something like 2,000 years back. A, a, a historian, a Greek historian, who talked in terms of going to space. He wanted to go to moon. At that time, the concept of force itself was not there. Therefore, he said, "I go on a boat. I go up the sea, and there is huge turbulence in the sea. There is a storm in the sea, and the sea pushes me up. I go to the moon. Mind you, that is the way. And whatever we do today is no different. When I talk in terms of Jules Verne, 1,800 years later." He talks in terms of Dalla Terra Alla Lune, that is from Earth to Moon. Well, he had a barrel in which he puts a spacecraft and launches people to the moon. And if you look at the construction of a spacecraft today, it's not much different from what Jules Verne had in mind. Mind, I mind you, I cannot use a cannon for pushing, but of course, people again are looking at this particular concept. And as I said just now, the geostationary orbit was not invented by a scientist or an engineer, by but by Arthur Clarke. Who lived his whole life in Sri Lanka, and uh, he also predicted Oumuamua in 1973, even though it was noticed only a few months ago. Having said that, if I have to sum up what we have been talking of, we talked in terms of rockets based on principles of nature, that means Beetle, limited by Newtonian mechanics. We said we have to get rid of Newtonian mechanics and talk in terms of. More relevant, the next generation. You will talk in terms of Einstein and relativistic mechanics in terms of field propulsion. Maybe it's time to think in terms of substituting the lower grade thermal energy. We find yes, chemical rockets are somewhat too slow, and even within the Milky Way galaxy, they are not very effective. Well, asteroids could probably be taken care of by deflecting it. Yes, we seem to have some means of doing it. Rockets have come a long, long way. That means during the last 50 years, and maybe, maybe we could talk in terms of reuse can be made suitable for space tourism. But this is a small thing. Maybe we have to talk in terms of field propulsion or relativistic propulsion. With that, I would like to conclude my talk. But I would like to bring two points to your notice. Well, there are different strategies, as we keep saying, and different innovative methods for. Moving in space for propulsion in space and protecting our planet as uh, protecting our planets are required. We also notice that the famous scientist Max Planck said, "Science advances one funeral at a time." I maybe people of my generation lived with Newtonian mechanics. Maybe you all will look at maybe relativistic mechanics. We'll look at field propulsion. Maybe the next generation will look at that. But something very encouraging is the father of rocketry, Robert, Robert Goddard, said, "I have learned to use the word impossible 
with the greatest of caution because what I ever dreamt as impossible is becoming possible. Therefore, let's have some faith in the future uses for rockets for space mission. And thank you for listening. Thank you.